welcome everybody to the to the four noon after tea session of the second international conference on philosophy of education. Uh, as usual, I request uh, you to put your mobile phones in a switched off mode or a, or a silent mode. Thank you for that. This session is titled Teachers and Teaching, and there will be two presentations in this session. First by Professor Poonam Batra from the Central Institute of Education, Delhi University. And her paper is titled Studying Education, Practicing Education, Contesting and Reimagining. Re the second paper is by Professor Ajay Sharma from the Department of Elementary and Social Studies Education, University of Georgia, USA. And his paper is titled Neoliberal Ontology of Teaching, a Critique. Our chair for this session will be Professor Winch and, uh, from King's College, London, UK. And I now call upon the speakers to share the dais with the chair. Professor Poonam Batra. Is this outside? We're waiting for you. <laughs> Roughly there will be 35 minutes uh, for yeah. presentation yeah. for each speaker and 15 minutes for questions and answers. So over to the chair. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome our two speakers, uh, Professor Poonam Batra who's going to present first on studying education, practicing education, contesting and reimagining. And as has just been said, uh, the format will be that each speaker will have um, 35 minutes for presentation, which allows us a solid 15 minutes for, for discussion. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Professor Bachelor. Thanks. So I just have to enter, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, let me uh, thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to share some of the ideas around uh, looking at uh, the tension, really, between educational studies, that is, you know, when you're, when you're pursuing education as a pursuit, and the practice of education, uh, often there's a hiatus between the two. In India, we don't have a tradition of education studies departments. There are very few spaces within universities. And nevertheless, the practice of education is what most departments in India do. And uh, therefore, there is very little engagement with education as an academic pursuit, uh, more in the nature of uh, looking at it as a practice. Um, I will very briefly um, talk about uh, the philosophical inquiry in education, which looks at three very specific areas. And I think these overlap with many other foundational disciplines, questions of teaching and professional practice, problems of learning and language, uh, sorry, learning and knowledge, and issues of wider social and cultural context. Uh, the aim, of course, is to elucidate, elaborate, and critically examine. Uh, the conceptual relations and logical structures and the justificatory patterns within existing education ideals. Um, uh, I'm sort of looking at uh, Dewey's um, uh, frame as a sort of backdrop to some of these ideas. Uh, the fact that uh, Dewey actually, um, you know, uh, sort of asserted that philosophy is the theory of education for him, and as as deliberate. Uh, practice, so to speak, and that philosophy raises questions, problematizes aims of education, nature of knowledge, human nature and practices, and inquiry into educational practice um, raises questions about epistemology, politics, ethics. Now, given this kind of a backdrop, I would now move to looking at the basic premises 
uh, in the time of reforms. Now we've had uh, liberalization processes for two decades and in this time of reform we've had several measures to look at education and to reform education and there are a few points which I have sort of uh, taken together as, as a basic premise on which I present the arguments today. The fact that there is an intimate link uh, between education of teachers and classroom practice. Now this appears to be very obvious but I think this is an unexplored area. It is not researched. Nobody really even thinks along these lines. Is, uh, is it not important for us to address how teachers are being prepared in order to understand what's happening inside the classroom or what is not happening? The second premise is that uh, the conventional epistemological frames that come in from foundations of education, so to speak, uh, that we are using within our context to educate teachers, uh, to my mind, these actually militate against the very social aims of education and the constitutional values that we need to stick by. This is a premise I'm making. It can be contested, it can be debated. The third premise is that there is, at the moment, given the kind of reforms we have, there's tension between what are policy imperatives and what is happening inside classrooms in the lived reality of school education. And the reimagination of education, which is, a, which is a dying need, because I've always sort of felt very strongly that if we suffer something in this country in terms of education, it's a poverty of imagination. And I think it's important to reimagine. But reimagination is possible only when the basic premises are contested, they are interrogated, and they are challenged. What are the dominant assumptions uh, that really shape current policy and pedagogic practice? Uh, very quickly, these are known to all of us, but to reiterate them, that education is a deliverable, that education is neutral, it is measured, evaluated in terms of learning outcomes, that curriculum is linked to student performance, and therefore, uh, what happens in the classroom in terms of curriculum transaction is dictated by what the students are supposed to learn, are supposed to have performed in tests. The concept of quality has got completely divorced from processes of teaching and learning because the focus is on outcomes. And uh, new ideas like learning can be made more efficient, learners and teachers need to be reformed. So the whole focus is on individual reform in terms of teachers and children. And those who learn are intelligent and educable, and those who do not learn are dull and uneducable. The aim of education is therefore only to develop skills, given the kind of reform, uh, skills that are demanded by the market, and therefore it is the practice of teaching that becomes the focus of preparing teachers rather than any sociological, philosophical engagement by way of theoretical reflection. But the curriculum discourse in our country, that's the paradox because uh, at one level we have the assumptions that I've just spoken about and practice continues to be driven by those assumptions. But at another level, we have a very progressive curricular discourse that seeks to transform pedagogic practice. And here we are talking about education as having wider, deeper aims, which has intimate links with society. Teachers are known to be significant in this frame in order to reimagine education. Quality is inherent in education, as it was for most philosophers whenever they spoke about education. And teachers are prepared to develop not only a repertoire of skills, but a perspective, whether it's about children, it's about knowledge, it's about learning, and therefore it's important that teachers engage with theory in order to develop frames of thinking. Um, the curriculum discourse specifically that seeks to prepare teachers uh, believes and is convinced 
that education is deeply political, that nature of teaching is a human project, despite the dominant view, as I said, that teaching is a skill, dispositions and perspective are important, and it's crucial that teachers understand the moral, the social, and the political life around them, themselves and children and society at large, and that education policy must focus on diversity, individual and social difference, and inclusion. Now, all this is sort of co-opted into a kind of a discourse, but it's not happening. Uh, and the reason why this is not happening, I suspect, lies in a very deeply dichotomous discourse in education, which is driven by the conventional epistemological frames within which we train our teachers, within which we educate our teachers. Now, some of the dichotomies are theory and practice, subject matter versus pedagogic approach, child in the curriculum, teacher and the curriculum, teaching as a practical knowledge and teaching as theoretical reflection, teaching and learning. I mean, we actually tell our teachers that there are instructional models and there are theories of learning, and we never sort of bring the two together in any way. And of course, reflexive and programmed, uh, programmed uh, technicians that we expect to develop out of our teachers. Now, the critical thing is the impact of such a dualistic discourse. We can go into the dualities as and when, maybe in the discussion, because that will take too much time. But I think it's important for us to understand what is happening as a result of this dualistic discourse. The foremost thing that is happening is that this dualism is actually marginalizing certain forms of thinking. Because we are forced to make certain choices, this or that, we don't ask questions like, what is the role of subject matter in a pedagogic approach? We ask questions like, what is, uh, what is to be taught? And is what is to be taught more important than how it is to be taught? So, you know, polarizing it giving it a forced choice kind of a framework. And therefore, it marginalizes the kind of questions that are necessary to emerge from educational practice. Often it leads to justifying gaps, like let's say between theory and practice, and rendering them beyond human control. Well, that's, that's something that most teachers believe in, you know. There is a perennial gap, we can't do much about it. And this kind of a dichotomous discourse is also immune to interrogation because you cannot really ask questions since you get stuck in a binary and therefore choices are forced. And this inability to release the educational thinking from a dichotomous discourse actually has led to looking at teachers and children as objects of reform. So you don't address the system, you don't address institutional aspects of how teachers are being prepared, how school is being run, all of that. But you look at individual actors as objects of reform. Now how do these conventional epistemological frames operate is the question. And I would say operate and persist in the manner they are. One of my arguments is that there is an institutional arrangement of a teacher education system, a program, an institute. And this arrangement is um, essentially around a series of conventions and rituals, whether it's to do with the way the day begins, whether it's to do with the assembly, whether it's to do with lesson planning, all of it, there is a certain system of rituals and these are uh, normative dispositions which are embedded in cultural practices. So this is not something that's coming from a particular theory of education or from a particular uh, disciplinary foundational theory, but it's coming a lot from, from the cultural beliefs uh, and assumptions that many student teachers come with and many teacher educators come with. And this is what sort of creates a habituated form 
of thinking and developing dispositions which stay entrenched in what is cultural belief which also means that there is intellectual isolation and this intellectual isolation in bernsteinian frame would be where culture gets transformed into the natural so there is no challenge of that and therefore it becomes a natural naturalized way of doing things uh, this further leads to engagement with pedagogy as a mere technique uh, also because as i said if knowledge is marginalized then there's no question of looking at knowledge as an important engagement in the way we will approach pedagogic communication and teaching then is viewed as mere practice of skills and therefore this very um, almost moralistic kind of an emphasis on completing the 40 lesson plans delivery that needs to be done but what feedback we give to the to the lesson plans or what uh, what kind of dialogue we have with our student teachers is always sort of left on the margins and for individual teachers to look at so the know how of teaching is rooted in psy psychological theory of individual learning and universal constructs sorry i just pick up some water uh so if you look at the education of teachers and uh we look at attempts within certainly the english speaking world uh uk us uh and elsewhere where there was attempt within the 1960s and 70s to interface foundational disciplines like sociology psychology philosophy to some extent economics political science with the practice of education but it was mainstream psychology which almost always determined the frame of pedagogic communication it was always mainstream psychology that was framing how curriculum was being transacted so while curriculum debates were happening outside of the classroom by way of the role of ideology in curriculum selection in curriculum design the 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 questions of knowledge whose knowledge legitimate knowledge official knowledge there are several sociologists who've engaged with those questions but within the classroom the student teacher was being trained to only look at curriculum transaction within the frame of mainstream uh psychology and this mainstream psychology most of us would be aware is something that comes from the psychometric tradition that looks at methods of modern science and that was an overarching influence but within psychology which knowledge gained currency also becomes an important question for example within the psychometric tradition emerged a sub discipline which we all as educators swear by and which is educational psychology but educational psychology creates certain kind of dualities in itself and for example um, within psychology the cross cultural discourse or the discourse of situated cognition the discourse of understanding how children's cognitive capacities develop as a result of an interface with the social milieu in which they live in those somehow got marginalized and they never came into the teacher education discourse so what did educational psychology uh, do in terms of creating the ethos of educating teachers it peripherizes the context and the specific it shifts the focus from the child to the learner so when it shifts the focus from the child to the learner it takes away the context of the child because the child is in context the learner 
is out of context. And the focus is on individual differences rather than uh, social differences. Or, for example, uh, the tendency of looking at children as either intelligent, average, or dull, coming straight from the psychometric approach, where today, in India, whether we go uh, deep into uh, into uh, the villages in Bihar or whether we go into urban areas, we find that teachers have a vocabulary uh, which talks about children being, uh, you know, more intelligent, children having less IQ. In fact, they use the term IQ when IQ is essentially a measure. It's not even a concept of intelligence. And this became uh, the focus uh, as a result of this frame of thinking. And hence, teacher knowledge uh, remains ahistorical and universalistic. This therefore forms a very good fit between looking at education as a neutral project and pedagogy as a mere technique. So when you strip something of its context, then you're actually emphasizing the neutrality of this whole business of the educational enterprise. Alongside, as a result of the educational psychology framework, there is the presence of the individual narrative, which looks at mental faculties, which focuses on teachers' personal knowledge, which is really related to practicing and therefore acquiring wisdom of how to teach, as I said, focus on the individual, not the social. And reform, therefore, is about individuals, not of institutional arrangements. Hence, research that foregrounds the social, that foregrounds the context, such as situated cognition, is kept marginal. Why? Because the aim is to leave the public posture of education and the practice of education as neutral and therefore you want to leave it undisturbed. Uh, children's identities, for example, are not questions that our teachers engage with uh, when they're learning uh, to, to become teachers. The consequences of marginalization of knowledge in curriculum is what now I'm going to focus on. Because knowledge is not substantively engaged with, because we've stripped many aspects, many concepts out of context, we've looked at pedagogy as a neutral process and as a technique. What we have done, therefore, we have created a learning environment for teachers where they learn and develop capacities to tolerate differences, which may be social in nature, based on caste, based on community, religion, language, and we are not enabling them to engage with the very concept of diversity, and therefore the concept of difference, and therefore the concept of discrimination, because knowledge is marginalized from curriculum. So knowledge becomes the process of learning to tolerate, uh, sorry, education becomes the process of learning to tolerate difference. In this framework, my argument is that culture is seen as knowledge itself. And cu cultural beliefs, cultural assumptions, cultural practices, all of that are defined in behavioral terms. So it would not be surprising to find people within the community of educators asserting over and over again that education is about reforming behavior. In fact, classroom accounts uh, done by various scholars within education in, in the Indian context also show that discipline and control are the key aspects of classroom discourse and interaction, even when there is an engagement with a subject matter. The key thing becomes disciplining and controlling children and therefore reforming children. And certain terminologies are used which indicate that children from certain communities need to be reformed because they do not have 
certain behavioral um, ways of engaging in a formal space of learning. And therefore, the aim of education is to discipline, control, and reform behavior. Now, there's a counter argument uh, which the curricular discourse, as I had said a little while ago, tries to uh, create, and which is that knowledge is central to curriculum. That knowledge is central to curriculum in two ways. One, in the form of textbook, which is in you know selected knowledge presented in a certain way, and as co-constructed within the quotidian of everyday learning. And this is what the NCF actually tries to talk about. I mean, it, it lifts the discourse of curriculum out of the textbook kind of a frame into the everyday classroom. And that is a very significant difference. But there has been an attempt in the earlier curriculum frameworks, and I'm specifically referring to the 2000 curriculum framework, where the attempt was to actually look at knowledge only within that which is given within the textbook. So in that framework, actually, the subjective experience of children and of the teacher were not important. What was important is what is embedded in the textbook given in a certain framework and therefore culture actually was presented as synonymous to knowledge or rather knowledge was to be seen as synonymous to culture. The difference in the NCF framework is that because knowledge does not stop only in terms of textbook materials. It is co-constructed by teachers and children within the classroom. Therefore, knowledge is something that is uh, built on the subjective experiences of the children, of the learners. And therefore, the subjective experience is threaded through formal knowledge, which means that in that process, knowledge is also interrogated. And the personal experiences and the social experiences, including cultural beliefs and assumptions, also get challenged, also get interrogated. So existing body of knowledge is understood as contextualized and interpreted in the socio-cultural frameworks. Now here the question that is important to address is the whole idea of contextualization. While both curricular frameworks may talk of contextualization, as I just clarified, that in an ideologically driven curriculum, the role of contextualization would be to shape curriculum in cultural terms. So you select and present knowledge in a manner that, that sort of foregrounds the cultural ways of looking at things, the cultural precepts of thinking. But the role of contextualization should be to enable constru construction of meaning in the classroom, which means that when we are trying to forge a link between textbook knowledge or a body of knowledge that exists and social experiences, culture becomes a means of meaning making. It becomes a vehicle to interpret the existing body of knowledge and to examine one's own cultural beliefs and assumptions. And it is not, therefore, the dominant precept of thinking. Embedded in the sociocultural context, therefore, textbook and learner knowledge is constructed, probed, and reconstructed. So we're doing simultaneously a co-construction, a deconstruction of existing body of knowledge and a probing and interrogation of the beliefs that we come with, whether we call them uh, cultural beliefs and assumptions, whether we call them lay theories, whether we call them lay knowledge. It's, it's a way of putting this. Uh, positioning this. And in this frame, culture becomes a means of meaning making 
and an object of inquiry, teachers examine the relationship between school and society, between the individual and the social, and underlying this process of knowledge construction is reasoned engagement with social construction. For example, what are the social constructions, the way we look at our, our society, the way we look at issues within society, and an inner reflection. So what I'm trying to say here is that reason alone and an intellectual engagement alone with issues of social construction, with issues of knowledge, with issues of culture cannot enable us to make the shifts in our thinking. The only way we can enable shifts in thinking, which is the purpose of education, is when we enable processes of inner reflection. And those processes of inner reflection uh, may have certainly uh, you know, driven by reasoning. It's not as if there's no reasoning there. But apart from reasoning, it is a question of the learner, and here I'm talking about the teacher specifically, who would have to see her own position in society, vis-a-vis -vis caste, vis-a-vis -vis gender, vis-a-vis -vis religion, vis-a-vis -vis community, the entire gamut of diversity, and unless she looks at her own position in society, a mere intellectual engagement with these issues will never create the push and the, and the provisioning of an inner reflective process. So you have to look at the individual and the social as simultaneous engagement in a pedagogic frame that I'm talking about. Um, so to counter the marginalization of knowledge in curriculum, it would be foolhardy to abandon a search for foundations because, you know, a lot of people are saying we don't need theory in education. All we need is practice and more practice because it is skill-based. Now, if we follow what the developed countries have tried to do over the past uh, several years is to de-link theory from educational practice, then we actually get into a very dangerous zone of abandoning the idea of truths, and by truths, of course, I don't mean a single truth, it means patterns. It means understanding how we can transcend particular contexts, particular circumstances and discourses. Because the autonomy of education itself needs to be protected, but it can be protected only when its aims and understandings are theorized. Without that, we're not able to engage with the nuances of what happens in practice. And to my mind, theory is required not for validation, not for explanation, but for a deeper reflection on the nature and implications of educational enterprise. And a philosophical engagement with education, for instance, would be necessary to resist what I'm calling um, the managerialism or the managerialization of educational practice in the current uh, neoliberal uh, context. And the way forward, and I'm ending with this slide, is that we need to problematize and debate curriculum and knowledge in teacher education. We've done that for school curriculum, but we haven't done that for the education of teachers. We need to understand how knowledge is being marginalized and how we need to counter this process. We need to deconstruct the universalistic and individualistic notions of learners and learning and inquire into the contestations, which is the institutional arrangements, how teacher socialization takes place in these arrangements, and how uh, the layered understanding of subject knowledge needs to be looked at. Um, coming back to the question of dualism, uh, dualism has another very significant impact when it marginalizes knowledges because it does not allow us to ask authentic research questions. And the authentic research questions can come from the field, can come from where education is being practiced because it's a very complex terrain. And therefore, uh, in order to engage with social reality, we would need an intellectual engagement and 
processes of inner reflection that can enable an authentic uh, dialogue. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Professor Batra for a very rich presentation and for leaving us now ample time for discussion. So uh, the floor is open. Uh, colleague here on my left. Uh, there'll be a microphone coming around, by the way. Hello. I've, I've noticed um, with my own students and uh, now over 30 years of teaching in a university that uh, they know a lot less now than they used to, same age. Um, and it's because of the web. Um, so that uh, it seems to them that actually knowing something is not so important. Um, I mean, knowing that so-and-so, as opposed to knowing how to find out something in a certain situation. Uh, so that um, they're increasingly seeing uh, uh, the classes as irrelevant uh, and so on, because it's all trumped by the resources uh, of, of the web. And so, uh, and, and the web, um, it's this idea that you know, individual knowledge really isn't so important. It's all there uh, for universal access on, on the web. And, and I just wonder, um, uh, though I'm inclined to agree with your emphasis on, 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 on knowledge, um, what do you think about this uh, development of, um, of information so readily available uh, on the on the World Wide Web. Uh, well, I think uh, the context may be a bit different here, but but your point is very valid. We do have a section of students here who are also quite uh, dependent on the web, really. Um, however, um, I would say that firstly we need to um, understand, and I think many of us do understand, but sort of uh, foreground the issue that knowledge is not the same as information. And uh, perhaps uh, in the morning presentation, uh, that is the kind of frame within which knowledge was being used, uh, that it is really equivalent to information. Uh, so the question is that is information and the explosion of information uh, that is not going to enable a nuanced understanding of educational practice and therefore the engagement of, um, of uh, concepts, of issues uh, will have to take place uh, within the realm of human interaction and, and this is one of the reasons why um, you know some of us are also very wary of the distance learning uh, mode of uh, teaching and learning specifically when you want to prepare teachers. So I think if we look at it in, in that frame uh, then uh, uh, the internet is or a web based sort of information explosion is is only going to take us away from uh, from uh, enabling a deeper engagement with the kind of issues that educational practice has to deal with and which teacher practitioners have to deal with. And therefore it's important that teacher educators uh, are at least provided the space to understand these differences. Thank you. I have two questions. Um, you spoke of knowledge as culture, and I think that is at the root of the fundamental hegemony around how knowledge is presented and one form of knowledge is presented as superior. But you also talked about the knowledge being mediated through experiences and the social acting upon the knowledge. My question is, would it 
would it or would it not be useful to redefine another form of knowledge itself? In some sense, it's not that the potter doesn't know how the pot is being made. He just doesn't know how to express it in the language that science accepts as a method of pottery making, right? So is that a question of actually validating another knowledge and not sometimes culture and uh, casting it in mere experience seems to me that it might even diminish that knowledge. So is there a, you know, is that another way that one should look at? Because you did say that the knowledge with respect to the learner has already been acted upon, but I'm actually not so sure that maybe, uh, I mean, I wanted to ask your opinion on that. And the second question is, you said education is being talked of as a neutral project. My uh, submission is maybe it's actually masquerading as a neutral project. It's actually a neoliberal agenda and a large politics of capitalism and all that that goes along. And it, it's, it's in the interest of that agenda for education to be seen as neutral. So your response is on that also. Thanks. Uh, well, I'll, I'll respond to the first, uh, uh, I'll respond first to the second issue. Uh, I, I agree, but you know, the fact that education uh, is being looked at as a neutral project is not new just within the neoliberal framework. I think for a long time, education is being positioned, and otherwise you wouldn't have a system of examination, public examination, which is basically unfair, projected as fair, and everybody actually accepts it. So I think the neutrality of education is something that's been positioned for a long time, but it is very much in the interest of the neoliberal project to maintain that and to, to further. And I think it's being advanced further as a result of advanced technology now. Uh, this, the, the first issue that you mentioned, I, I, I completely agree with you that culture by itself um, you know, is, is, uh, is not something that we build upon uh, in our educational learning environments. But what I'm trying to say is that there's a fundamental difference in the way culture, and by culture, you know, we can mean so many things. So it's very tough to explain all of that in, in a matter of a few minutes, but I think we do need to engage. For example, in India, we are facing the challenge of culture being literally defined as religion. And, and there are lots of problems associated with that. But when I'm talking of culture, I'm meaning, uh, you know, traditional ways of looking at things, beliefs, assumptions, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that sort of carry on from generation to generation. The, the fundamental difference is between the curricular discourse that is being advocated today through the NCF and the curricular discourse that was advocated uh, in a political regime which tried to uh, actually foreground an ideologically uniformized way of looking at both culture and education. The whole idea of Indian identity and so on, right? The fundamental difference is that while we agree, and I think it's important for educators to understand that cultural assumptions and beliefs will have to be brought to the table for dialogue and for interrogation. Why? Uh, because we need to build on existing beliefs of learners, and I hear I'm talking of teachers, but we also need to uh, look at culture as an object of interrogation. It just cannot be a vehicle for meaning making. The difference uh, between this and looking at culture as an ideological artifact is that you reduce culture then to just a form of knowledge which is legitimized already and you do not need to interrogate it. That is the difference and I'm trying to point out that we cannot throw culture out. We have to bring it in into the formal discourse when we prepare our teachers, but we need to bring it in in both ways, as a meaning-making exercise and as an object of epistemological inquiry. Thank you. Uh, colleague there, uh, and then there. Is that a real construct? Is there a theoretical framework which justifies the kind of a classroom engagement for real learning? Uh, I don't know if I've completely understood your question, but uh, classroom research, why does it need to be a closed concept? I, I think the, in fact, 
uh, research uh, makes a very significant learning framework, I think. And it would be a very good idea if we look at research within and outside the classroom in order to engage with several concepts uh, that are related to educational practice. The point I think would be important is that we do not look at the uh, classroom space as the only frame available to us to inquire into classroom-based issues, that we need to draw upon disciplines. Um, which, uh, which are philosophical in orientation, which are sociological in orientation, that help us to look at classroom processes from interdisciplinary lens. No, I think uh, I was trying to say that by classroom by definition will impose a lot of constraints, you know, unlike an you know, open village, you know, a kind of a learning environment. Okay. Uh, so it's, I think, you know, fundamentally flawed idea that, you know, you can actually learn in a classroom. Yeah, yeah, okay. In yeah, that I think, sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, sure, I don't think there's a, there's a difference uh, so, but, on that. But is, do you have an idea how it can be, you know, it's, it can be for, you know, really implemented, you know? Well, I will have to think about that a bit more. Yeah. Um, I have, yeah. I have one or two. Oh, sorry. Um, um, yes, gentlemen over there. Um, thank you very much. Very, very uh, good paper. I will reiterate some of the points in my presentation on uh, Wednesday on limits of measuring education. Um, just want to make a comment and then a question. Um, the comment is the um, your point on knowledge as culture uh, is reflected, or the violation of that point in managerialist thinking of education is reflected in uh, reforms in the United States, uh, uh, like the Common Core, where um, students are explicitly discouraged from reflective thinking that um, involves their own experience. For example, when a, uh, one of the advocates came to our school, School of Education, to um, argue for the Common Core, they were saying, well, if students read the uh, letter from a Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King, uh, which is a very, you know, important document in the U.S. history, we don't want them to talk about their own experience with racism. We want them to state what the letter actually says, um, which is a weird way of um, uh, thinking about uh, education. So that's my comment to um, to support your main uh, argument. My question is, and, and I don't expect a, an answer from, you know, a, a simple answer from you, but I think it's a question for the whole uh, conference. Why do we think um, has the managerial and <coughs> neoliberal project of education reform been so immensely successful? Mm when it is, um, upon reflection, so stupid. Um, and um, my, uh, the, uh, an answer I would see, uh, seek in the direction of uh, our complicity in it when we think of education as a science, as opposed to a sphere of practical wisdom, which is how Aristotle would have thought about it. Thank you. Um. Well, I thought that was meant to be a general comment, but I can, I can just quickly say that uh, the fact that uh, you know education is looked at as practical wisdom is what lends itself to be captured by the managerial framework. We could have a difference on that. Yes. <laughs> okay, we've got about four minutes left. There was a, somebody uh, could yes, uh, back of the room. Uh, yeah. Just got uh, time for that. I, one. I have. I have a few queries about uh, when you talked about the learning outcomes. Uh, what do you mean by learning outcomes? Uh, uh, this is a very simple uh, kind of uh, the question. Uh, do you mean uh, you know the learning outcomes uh, beyond the examination systems we are having uh, in the traditional systems? The second thing is uh, who is going to decide these learning outcomes? Uh, it's the institutions so who is going to decide or it's a state, or it's a market. Because as you said, the new liberal, like, you know, the economic policies, uh, most of the places the education has, you know, the system is going to change. Uh, and then learning outcomes concept has emerged that, uh, but 
is there any provisions to uh, you know the learners can participate to decide their learning outcomes uh, these are the few queries if you highlight that uh, well, this can be a long-drawn engagement because what are learning outcomes is at the moment uh, within the frame of large-scale high-stakes testing which has happened across the world and India is <clears throat> also participating. We've already done that in PISA, two states. Uh, the tendency to look at uh, what children are able to learn and perform in a given standardized test uh, is sort of dictating what is happening within the classroom. And that is where the problem is. I mean, I think uh, looking at what children are able to learn, how they're able to learn, per se, does not have a problem. But it's the way we are positioning it. Uh, we all would be quite aware of the fact that because of the international testing regimes, uh, uh, the classrooms have been impacted very deeply. For example, uh, all major testing regimes do not look at social science. It only looks at languages, mathematics, and science, with the result that uh, from the everyday timetable of a school, social science has virtually disappeared. So there are several aspects to, I think, this question, and it requires, there's a lot of literature on this, but the question is that within this neoliberal framework, we are once again uh, also getting caught as a country in this kind of testing. So we are divorcing questions of quality from teaching and learning, and we are only uh, getting focused on what teacher, what children will do in terms of performance on these tests. Questionable. Thank you very much. I think we are out of time now, um, but I, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Batra again and. Uh,